So I know you think you're familiar with the crop death subjection and rebuttal, but you're not. I mean, maybe you're familiar with some of it, but you might not be familiar with all of it. But just to refresh you, the objection goes something like this. If you really want to kill the most things, be a vegan because the farmers who protect your beans kill everything. In order to grow tofu, you have to kill every ground squirrel, every vole, every shrew, every snake, every turtle, every frog, every bird, every rabbit, anything that gets in that bean field, I'm either gonna plow and dismember, which is why the crows and the, and the seagulls Vultures. follow the, the, uh, the, combines. the combines every year. And then if anything does survive my first slaughter, I'm gonna come in with Monsanto and poison the shit out of everything Thing, so you can have a tofu salad and not be responsible for any death. F you. That's a really good point, and it's Hello? a point that a lot of people ignore. You ever plow a field somewhere to plant the quinoa or sorghum or whatever the hell it is you eat? You kill everything on the ground and under it. You kill every snake, every frog, every mouse, mole, vole, worm, quail. You kill them all. And the vegan rebuttal goes like this. What do farm animals eat? Air? No, they eat plants, and lots of them. So if the people making these claims really care about mice, then they should go vegan. Less harm to both farm and field animals. Veganism actually minimizes the number of crop deaths you're responsible for. The reason for this is that it takes around 10 times more crops to feed the average non-vegan than the average vegan due to all the copious amounts of crops used to raise the 60 billion or so land animals massacred every year and many of the billions of farmed marine animals as well. Add to that the fact that animal agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation which kills countless species every single second and carnism is the ultimate way to maximize plant-related killings. Seems open and shut, right? Well, unfortunately, anti-vegan disinformation, or discourse if we're being charitable, has gotten more sophisticated lately. And I wanna offer a more comprehensive debunking and also clear up a few things vegans seem to be confused about. So let's start where we left off. No, they eat plants, and lots of them. The anti-vegan comeback here is that animals eat parts of the crops we can't. In fact, there's a popular infographic from the website Sacred Cow that puts a specific number on this. They say 86% of global livestock feed consists of things humans cannot digest, with nearly half coming from grass. So pause and understand the implication here. Because of the implication. We say it takes way more crops to feed animals. Hence, animals cause more crop deaths, plus the direct deaths of the animals we are eating. The anti-vegan says, actually because 86% of crops are inedible to humans and we can feed those to animals, that can't be true unless vegans are actually responsible for more crop deaths on a per calorie basis. And this is where the confusion comes in, including from vegans. So let's take a look at where that number comes from and also who it comes from, because frankly, it's pretty amazing. Amazing. The infographic cites this study from 2017. And if we look right there, right in the abstract, right at the beginning, we see that sweet, sweet 86% figure. So looks like it checks out. But wait, what's this? In that exact same abstract, it says it takes around three kilograms of human edible crops to get one kilogram of human edible animal. That's roughly a threefold inefficiency in the other direction. The very paper from whence this comes shows right there, right in the abstract where you can't possibly miss it. And where Sacred Cow author Diana Rogers couldn't possibly miss it, that animal ag still takes way more crops, even when we're looking at just the human edible portion. And to some extent, that's it. We got them. Got him. <laughs> we could stop the whole video right there and say this claim has been put to rest, but it actually gets way worse for the animal ag side of this equation. So rather than just debunking the claim, let's see if we can't actually just pummel it into the dust. Plus I know some of you are still confused right now, and I know that because I did an Instagram poll on it. So 86% of global livestock feed is human inedible, and yet animal ag still requires about three times the amount of human edible crops. How is that possible? It seems like a contradiction, right? Well, first let's lay some basic science groundwork, compliments of me from the past. Even if plants can feel pain, and even if we know that harvesting them causes pain, it still doesn't imply that you should eat animal products. And that's because more plants are injured and killed to feed humans who aren't on a vegan diet. To understand why, let's look at the trophic pyramid. The trophic pyramid illustrates the way food energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next in the food web. So at the bottom, we have what are called producers, generally plants which get their energy from the sun. Above that, primary consumers are those organisms which eat producers. And above that, the secondary consumers that eat primary consumers, and so on. Plus, we've got decomposers that dip their toe in at every level. 
The critical thing to note here is the energy lost as we climb the pyramid. On average, 80 to 90% of the energy or calories are lost as heat on each ascending level. That's because not all the energy an animal consumes is used to build tissue that we can then eat. The animal has to use energy to move, think, digest, and execute many other metabolic activities. And we humans can't eat the movement and thoughts of animals. Those calories have been largely transmuted into unusable heat. And this is just a fundamental principle of thermodynamics. In fact, it's the second law of thermodynamics. According to Lumen Learning, none of the energy transfers and transformations in the universe is completely efficient. In every energy transfer, some amount of energy is lost in a form that is unusable. In most cases, this form is heat energy. And just to be clear, the trophic pyramid wasn't something cooked up by a vegan think tank. You can find this in any introductory ecology textbook. And the same can be said of thermodynamics, which is part of virtually any introductory chemistry textbook. Now, the exact numbers in agriculture are admittedly more complicated because of the aforementioned differential in digestion between humans and ruminants. But the general principle of energy loss remains. And I know this all might be getting a little technical, but I promise at the end I'll talk about how I'd actually handle this objection in a real conversation. All right, so now that you're refreshed on trophic levels and thermodynamics, come along with me as I tell you about the most mythical and beautiful of creatures, the efficient cow. We'll call her Bessie. This cow's superpower is that she can eat crops and perfectly convert them into human and edible calories with no loss in efficiency. And what that means is that if Bessie eats a thousand kilograms of crops, she'll create a thousand kilograms of edible flesh. So here we have her eating one of these 86% inedible food units. So the 86% figure is preserved and we'd be going from 140 human edible kilograms to a thousand human edible kilograms. But Bessie isn't real. Sorry, Bessie. So let's imagine a slightly less efficient cow. We'll call her Mabel. Mabel needs to eat 5,000 kilograms of crops to yield 1,000 kilograms of edible flesh. But look, each unit of food she's eating is still the same composition of edible to inedible. So the 86% figure is still preserved, but this time we're going from 700 human edible kilograms to 1,000 human edible kilograms. All right, but forget about Mabel. She's also not real. Mabel, we talked about this. Let's key in on what the cow might actually look like, according to their numbers. The realistic cow, if you will. We'll call her Muffin. Muffin needs to eat 20,000 kilograms of crops to yield 1,000 kilograms of human edible flesh. So she's gonna eat 20 of these food units, meaning that 86% is still preserved, but this time we're going from 2,800 human edible kilograms to 1,000 human edible kilograms, which is more like what the paper reports. So this is how these two things can be true at the same time. The percent of human edible kilograms, as well as the total amount of kilograms, both matter and affect the final efficiency. In other words, any percent advantage these animals have with respect to eating things we can't is totally overshadowed by the sheer volume of crops they eat. So much so that even with relatively favorable percentages, they still require far more total human edible crops in absolute terms. And if this still isn't making sense, here's a sort of analogy. If I told you 86% of my friends had brown eyes and 14% had green eyes, and you said, wow, you don't have very many green-eyed friends, that would be a hasty conclusion. You don't know if I have 50, 500, or 5,000 friends. So you don't know if I have 7, 70, or 700 green-eyed friends. In other words, both the percent and my total friends affect the total number of green-eyed friends I have. Now it gets a little more complicated than that, so if you're interested, check out the pinned comment where I'll go into a little more detail. But look, maybe the lead author on this study is some sort of crazy vegan extremist, hell-bent on getting us all to be lentil-eating hippies. Except she's not. She's this person, with farmed animals in her LinkedIn banner picture. She's the Livestock Development Officer at the FAO, and she's been working there with livestock in her job title for the past decade. And just for funsies, here's a picture of her budding up with cave painting enthusiast Frederick Leroy and Frank Miltner, a scientist with so many shady, meat-friendly financial ties that the New York Times actually did an entire piece on him. All right, but I'm not showing you this because I think it's impossible for her to conduct objective, worthwhile research. I'm just getting ahead of the inevitable claim in the comments that this study was some sort of vegan propaganda funded by the Gates Foundation. Gates Foundation is one of the major sponsors of this study that okay. I was just talking so about. so it's great. Now, maybe you're saying, well, mass doesn't equal calories. Maybe that one kilogram of human edible animal is three times as calorie dense as the edible animal feed. So the first thing to note is that the feed is in dry matter. So if we go to chronometer and search the dry version of the most common crops used to feed animals and that are edible to us, we can get a rough idea of the calorie density of that food. And it seems to roughly be around 15, 16, 1700 calories. But wait, weren't we talking in kilograms? Why does it say 454 grams? Because that's how many grams are in a pound. And I'm going with pounds because I'm from America. America! Yeah! 
All right, so how does that compare to a pound of edible animal? Well, an actual animal isn't a uniform piece of flesh like a chicken McNugget. So we have to look at how the animal breaks down and then do what's called a weighted average of the calories for each part. And when we do that, we get about 900 calories per pound for a cow. So when looking at cows, we actually get less calories per pound. Now, obviously there's gonna be some variability in these numbers. The dried versions of those crops might be slightly different than what's on chronometer, different animals while different body compositions. But even if we assume a cow is 100% 80-20 ground chuck, we'd still only get around 1100 calories per pound. And the larger point is this, that we're nowhere close to the cow being three times as calorically dense as dry matter crops. And just to buttress this idea with something that isn't just napkin math, this paper finds that, given the current mix of crop uses, growing food exclusively for direct human consumption could, in principle, increase available food calories by as much as 70%, which could feed an additional 4 billion people. And currently, 36% of calories produced by the world's crops are being used for animal feed. And only 12% of those feed calories ultimately contribute to the human diet. But you know what? In the interest of being extra charitable, let's imagine that ideal case for a minute. You have a cow, pig, or chicken that takes in a thousand calories of human edible crops and puts out a thousand calories of edible flesh. At that point, it's the same amount of deaths, right? Well, again, no. On average, you'll have the same amount of deaths associated with crops, sure. But then you have to tack onto that the death of the actual animal you're eating, plus all the incidental deaths that occur in the rearing of the animal you're eating. Farmed animals often need to be protected from predators and so-called vermin like rats. Farmed animals will also be killing insects either by stepping on or eating them. Land has to be cleared for the farmed animals, which will also result in incidental deaths. And buildings have to be constructed, which means trees have to be chopped or has to be mined, and some excess fossil fuel has to be extracted and burned, all processes which most certainly kill some number of animals. Now maybe you're thinking, hey, why are you focusing so much on just one research paper? Well, there's two reasons for that. One, this is the paper from which this objection was popularized by a very not vegan friendly individual. And two, the fact that animals convert crops inefficiently is already well established in the field of animal husbandry, where they calculate that inefficiency with measures like residual feed intake, feed efficiency, and feed conversion ratio. Feed conversion ratio basically works like this. If a pig has an FCR of three, that means it takes three kilograms of feed to get one kilogram of pig. If a chicken has an FCR of one, that means it takes one kilogram of feed to get one kilogram of chicken. So the higher the number, the worse it is from an efficiency standpoint and the more overall crops you'll need. So let's take a look at some FCR estimates from a bunch of different places. And you tell me how many of them are above one. So yeah, and this is the thing. We've got converging agreement between the fields of chemistry and physics, ecology, animal husbandry, and a paper authored by someone who to say the least, isn't super vegan friendly. The fact that multiple diverse fields all point in the same direction gives us massive confidence in our conclusion that feeding crops to animals will be inherently inefficient. And frankly, the fact that people are still trying to say otherwise is kind of mind boggling. Like given what we know about thermodynamics and trophic levels, we would expect to see exactly what we do see in these studies with respect to feed conversion ratio. And in fact, if we saw the opposite, it would be surprising to the point that we'd probably call the study into question. But it can't get worse than that, can it? Well, remember this graphic from earlier where we just sort of accepted that this 86% represented stuff that humans cannot digest? Well, if we look at the actual paper again, we'll see right there, right in the abstract, it says, of which 86% is made of materials not currently eaten by humans. This is a subtle but important change. Also, this 86% is often framed as basically just waste, and the only thing we can do with it is feed it to animals. But once you start considering co-products, emerging in future technology that can process this waste, emerging in future technology that can reduce crop deaths, green manure, polycropping, veganic farming, the fact that some of this grazing land is suitable for crops and or can be rewilded, and that grass-fed cows are terrible for the environment, even this 86% starts to look like less of an anti-vegan slam dunk. But we're gonna talk about all that at length in a longer version of this video with Vegan Gaze and Chris Hines. But actually, just for you guys, let's touch on one last bit of this. As vegans, we often hear that even if animals are poor converters of calories, at least they upcycle protein. But do they? Well, to answer that, first we have to talk about soy cakes. No, not those kind of cakes. Soy cakes are what's left over after you extract the oil from soybeans. And while most of current soy cakes are fed to livestock, they can be used for human edible foodstuffs like soy flour and soy protein. Not to mention we don't even have to process the soy like this. Soybeans can be processed in various ways to get various end products, even in your own kitchen. And of the two, soy cakes and soy oil, soy cakes are the primary economic driver and thus considered the main driver of land use and therefore in competition with human food production. Per the paper's own criteria, 
area. But the paper didn't factor in soy cakes as inputs for this calculation. And if it had, these numbers would get even worse from both a kilogram and a calorie perspective. But they did include soy cakes in some of the calculations. The only problem is you have to go to the part of the paper no one reads the methods section. And if we go there and look at this column, we'll see that on average, they don't upcycle protein. On average for ruminants, it's a wash. And for monogastrics, there's about a four times inefficiency. And this is the metric where meat is supposed to be king. Now those numbers are of course, averaging many different types of animals. But even if we look at the grazed cattle and buffalo in countries like the US and Canada, we still only get 0.9, about an 11% efficiency gain in protein while being about four times less efficient from a total kilogram perspective when looking at boneless meat. But this whole table is gonna be explored in more depth in that longer video. Now here's the thing about all this debunking crop death rhetoric. It does double duty versus a bunch of other anti-vegan arguments. Vegans use fertilizer on their crops, which kills animals via eutrophication. Cool, non-vegans are responsible for growing way more crops per capita and therefore use way more fertilizer. Not to mention the animals also produce feces, which itself causes, you guessed it, eutrophication. Plants are sentient and vegans don't care about them. Cool, non-vegans are responsible for growing way more crops per capita and therefore kill or injure way more plants. Veganism encourages monocultures. Cool, non-vegans are responsible for growing way more crops per capita to feed animals and therefore encourage way more monocropping. You get the idea. Now it's also important to point out that ultimately this whole rebuttal was on their terms, on non-vegans terms. I've just taken it for granted this whole time that we consider crop deaths to be morally equivalent to the deaths of animals we breed into existence and whose bodies we literally tear to pieces in our mouths. But obviously many vegans are going to contest that moral equivalency. It's just that in my humble opinion, debunking someone on their own terms with their own assumptions tends to be an easier lift and oftentimes more persuasive. So how would I respond to this in person in like an outreach style conversation? First I'd start by agreeing that animals are killed in crop production. Then I'd probably go a little Socratic and ask the person what we feed to animals. Then I'd correct them or add information based on their answer. Next, I'd ask if they think animals convert the food they eat with 100% efficiency and sort of lead them down the path to see if I could get them to come to the conclusion on their own. Maybe I'd point out how animals use energy to move, think, urinate, and run general maintenance of their internal organs and how we can't eat those calories. If I couldn't do that or there were time constraints or this was in the comment section of an Instagram post or something, I'd probably go with something more like this. Animals are definitely killed in crop production. Production. The thing is, the animals you eat are also fed crops, and they don't convert those crop calories efficiently. And that's even when we consider that they eat parts of the crop that we can't. So by eating animals, you're not just causing the death of that animal, but you're also multiplying the crop deaths you would have caused had you just eaten the crops instead. Even if we look at a paper authored by the Livestock Development Officer at the FAO, so not a vegan-friendly source, it concludes that on average there's about a three times inefficiency, meaning eating an animal doesn't just kill that animal, but it also takes about three times the amount of crops to feed that animal, meaning any problem that arises in crop production, more land use, more fertilizer, more pesticides, more greenhouse gas emissions, more crop deaths, is tripled when we add animals into that equation. Also, I haven't talked about the 100% grass-fed elephant in the room yet, but it'll be part of the longer video and maybe also a video I do independently. So stay tuned for that. And if you want to help me make this my full-time career, check out the Patreon in the description. And shout out to Ryan O'Neill, Tom Eisenbeis, Nutbase News, Monstar, David Yastrzemski, and Maxwell Edison.